are worshiping with us today, and we are getting ready for Easter. We started an Easter series last Sunday, and Easter is in two weeks, and um, we're going to do, we're just going to stick with our normal two services um, on Easter, so they're going to be a little fuller uh, than usual. And so a couple things, if you can, we encourage you to come to the early service, because most new people will come to the later service. I also encourage as many people as possible to kind of view your Easter Sunday as kind of a two-service experience where you come to uh, worship at one and then figure out a place where you can serve in the other because our, we're going to need more greeters that day. Our kids' classrooms are going to have more people in it. So I just encourage you, man, if you're available on Easter to kind of help serve, I encourage you to maybe just put that on a connection card or talk to one of the staff, figure out a way that not only on Easter can you be a part of, of celebrating the awesome thing that Jesus did for us on the cross, but we also get an opportunity to be a part of uh, helping ensure that everyone has an incredible um, experience and encounter with God that day. So we need, we, need, we need people, and so I encourage you to be a part of that. And also, it being Easter, there's a lot of people that, um, that only come to church really around Easter, and some, some people give those people a hard time. Um, you make up names for them. You know, Creaster is one of them. You heard that one. Christmas, Easter go together with CEO. You know, Christmas, Easter only. People do that. I, it, it, I don't. I, to me, it's a privilege. It's a privilege. It is not an insult to have people who only come once or twice a year. It is a privilege that we get to have as a church to be able to love and serve people, even if it's only once a year. And so we're going to have people in our church that normally aren't a part of a church, and we get to love and serve them. And that means, honestly, for you, that there are people in your life that um, normally might would not be responsive to an invitation to be a part of church that will be around Easter. So I encourage you, man, to just to be praying. Let's pray for each other. That God will bring those people out that we can talk to and that we'll have the boldness to invite them. And I always encourage people to make the invites as specific as possible because the more specific, the more likely it is for it to happen. Hey, would you like to come to me at church on Easter? Yeah, I guess. Well, that's something. But it's also, hey, would you like to come with me at church? Uh, we can go to the 1030 service if you like. We can meet at the parking lot at 1020, and we can walk in together. And you make that kind of very specific kind of ask, and you'll find people are responsive to it. Especially, man, people like, it's nerve, it's, people get nervous walking into a church for the first time. To walk in with a friend will just make it a lot easier for them. So I just encourage you to kind of have your, your mind around that over the next couple of weeks and see who God might would bring uh, to your attention that you might could minister to this Easter. So that's in two weeks. We're looking forward to that. In the meantime, leading up to this, we've been looking at these, uh, basically there's these seven sayings that Jesus said while he was on the cross. And I think that, that what we see here in these, in these things that Jesus says, we see kind of a, a real glimpse into the heart of Jesus. Because, you know, when you're, when you're at your most vulnerable, you know, what, what, what really is in there comes out. You know, if, if you're tired and, and, and well-rested, you, you can fake it with people, right? But, you know, there's, there's certain moments and certain times where, like, you, the, the filters are gone and who you are really comes out. And so Jesus here at his weakest, at his most vulnerable, and we're seeing just kind of the character that comes through. Because, you know, who you really are comes out in these moments. And I had one of these moments uh, several years ago when I had surgery. And, you know, if you've ever had surgery, you know, the, you know, they, 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 you know they give you the stuff to knock you out. But it doesn't just knock you out. It kind of, you, know, you know, just you know, releases you a little bit, right? And... Um, and, and, and I noticed this the very first time my, my wife had, had, had surgery and I was there in the recovery with her. And there's something that I, I didn't know until that moment, which is you, you kind of have these, this series of memory loss. And I have a story. It's, it's, I think it's hilarious. Heidi doesn't think it's hilarious, so I don't tell it. But anyway, you know, she just kept saying the same thing over and over again. And eventually got to the point to where, like, I, I, I giggled a little bit. She's like, why are you laughing? I'm like, it doesn't matter. You're not gonna, you're not gonna remember, and um, and and so anyway, so then of course then it happens to you. You make fun of somebody, then it happens to you, right? So I was I was having a um, I was having a cyst removed, and this was you know 10, 12 years ago, and it just so happened that the surgery, the day of my surgery, happened to be the day that these other surgeons seemed to be taking out every kid's you know, tonsils or adenoids or whatever. So it was me in the waiting room with a whole bunch of like six, seven year old kids, right? And there's this one little girl, and this one little girl, she was maybe five, 
and she had glasses on. And I'm telling you, there's nothing more precious to me in the world than like little bitty girls with glasses. Like I see them, it's like, you can, you can have all of my money. You can just, you can have everything. They're just so cute with the little glasses. And she, you know, and, and, and I try not to be weird, but I was just kind of watching her. She was just so cute and it was just awesome. And so then I had the surgery and then it just turns out as, as I come to, right, um, I look over and right in the bed next to me, she's, she's just knocked out. She's just right there. She's recovering too and it's kind of, Breaks my little heart, and I'm like, I look at the nurse, and I'm like, is she, is she okay? And the nurse goes, <laughs> and I was like, what? I didn't, it's not fun. Oh, have, have I said that before? Yeah, like eight times. <laughs> okay, that's great. So apparently, even, even the most vulnerable out of it, me, is still really compassionate towards little cute little girls with glasses, right? So what we see in Jesus, what we, what we saw last week, really, was kind of this deep expression of his humanity. He, he cried out for being, being thirsty. He, he felt like he was abandoned by God. And, and so we see this, you know, we, we think of Jesus as exclusively kind of this deity and the Son of God. But I mean, we see in those moments just this deep expression of real humanity pouring out emotional needs of feeling abandoned by God, expressing physical needs of thirst. But we're going to look at a couple today, we're going to look at a couple of these things, a couple of stories uh, little incidents there where Jesus was on the cross. Well, the thing that we're going to see now is, is how Jesus' heart was focused on others. You know, I mean, here he is at his most vulnerable. He has been tortured for hours. He is dying a very painful death. And if there's ever a time where it's okay to be selfish, it is when you are being executed after having been tortured. I mean, it's like I, he, he just could feel the freedom, you would think, to just, to just be in pain, to just cry out. But we see in Jesus, even though he is going through this horrible torture, this horrible execution, we're going to see in these stories that his heart was on someone else. And so while he did express these physical needs and emotional needs, that's not where he was. Most of us, probably all of us, would have just been doing everything that we could to kind of hold it together and just express our pain and hurt and need. But we're going to see in these stories of Jesus how even in this moment, His heart is focused on the needs of other people around Him. So again, we're going to look at a couple of different passages here. And the first one is in John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And so of all the things that we're going to look at today and over the next few weeks, this is probably one of the, the least theologically significant one, like where we learn some great new insight into the, the very nature of who Jesus is. But I think even in its simplicity, again, again just like, like last week, this is a very honest expression of Jesus' humanity, but it also shows an incredible heart and compassion. Because at its very simplest, what he does here is he took care of his mom. He saw his mom and said, I mean, somebody needs to take care of my mom. And, and so right next to her is, is, is a disciple that, that he had a great relationship with. And basically says, will, will, you, will, you ta- will you take care of my mom? Like I cannot imagine from her perspective what was, what was going on there and, and the grief that she's experiencing and uh, of seeing that happen to her son. And in that moment, in this darkest grief, and her watching her son go through this, we see a son say, I want to make sure, though, that you're okay. I mean, what a, what a good son. And somewhere there's a Mother's Day sermon that all of our moms want to preach to us, right? To just say, yeah, take care of your mom. And, and this is not the only time that we see this in Jesus. And I think this is, there is an important point. While this may not be of great theological significance, I think it is of importance for us in our lives. Because you follow the story of Jesus, and we see Jesus and Mary, his mom, and then Joseph, you know, who raised him like he was his son, you know, essentially his dad. And um, 
We see it all the way through Jesus being 12 years old. We still see Joseph. And then suddenly we, we skip ahead to Jesus is 30 years old and we see his ministry. And we don't talk about Joseph at all anymore. Mary's still around. Um, his, he has brothers now. So obviously Joseph and Mary had, had some children. And, and so we're trying to figure out um, oh, where, did, where did Joseph go? And so you see kind of at this moment you know, he feels this need to make sure somebody takes care of his mom. Most people believe that Joseph has at some point passed away. And what really this does is explains a question that I, I, answers a question that I have, which is why would the Son of God come to earth to kind of teach us, to show us how to live, to, to bridge the gap between us and God, and from 12 to 30 essentially just kind of hang out? Right? I mean, don't you have Jesus things you should be doing? Right? I mean, you should, there's lots of more people you could have healed. There's lots more teaching. I mean, we've got like a three-year window of your teaching. What would have been like, what, wouldn't 15 years have been better? Well, if his dad passed away, well, what was he doing? Probably making sure his mom was taken care of. Earning money, taking over the carpentry business to make sure that, that his mom was taken care of until his younger siblings were able to do it. And so Jesus, with the absolute more, most important mission and job that the world has ever known, made sure at every moment that his family was taken care of. Now, I'm sure your job's important too. And, and the thing that God's called you to is important. I'm not saying that it's not. But make sure that you hear me say this. Um, Jesus had different priorities than most of us have. As far as where I'm going to put my primary attention. He gave primary attention. Even though he was the son of God with the greatest mission any person has ever had. He gave primary attention to his parents. And honestly I think that's a value that's been lost. Especially those of us maybe who have aging parents or whatever. I think it's important for us to make sure that we have a mentality that says. That part of being who I am is taking care of my family. Really all of us taking care of each other. And even though Jesus had this incredible spiritual mission, he wanted to make sure that his family was taken care of as well. And so I, I think, again, while maybe not of great theological significance, I think it is an incredible reflection of his character. And it is important for us to model that because I think as we continue to go through this series, we're going to learn a lot about Jesus, which should draw us to him. But also, man, if again, I, want, I say I'm a follower of Jesus... That means I'm going to live out his values too. And his heart was focused on others and he took care of his mom. He took care of his family, made sure they were okay. And so, um, we continue on. We've got some other things. And this one is, I, I think, going to have a little bit more weight to it for a lot of us. And it's in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So imagine this scene, and it's a, it's a crazy, chaotic, awful scene. Here's Jesus being executed, really for no crime at all. Just having annoyed the religious leaders of his time, and threatened their, their stranglehold on their religious power over the people, but really hadn't committed a crime. Pontius Pilate, the, the, the Roman governor, knew he hadn't committed a crime. He this guy hasn't committed a crime. But just essentially to get those people to shut up, I like, kill him anyway. And so he's being executed. 
And, and the religious leaders, they're just mocking him, mocking, making fun of him. And, 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 and the Roman soldiers, who could not care less about whether this guy's innocent or not, just some, just some other Jew for us to kill, so who cares? Not even, barely even a real person, just mocking him. Oh, you're the king, are you? Why don't you come save yourself? Just hurling insults at him. He's surrounded by criminals. And at least one of them is mocking him too. He's like, hey, why don't you save us? You save all these other people. Why don't you save you? Why don't you save all of us? All around him. Insults, mockery. And this is after hours of torture and dying a slow, painful death on a cross. Now, I don't know what you would, I don't know what's in your heart. I don't know what you're like. But let me, I, I can easily imagine what I would be like in that situation, especially if I were Jesus. I'd be sitting up there on the cross and be thinking, it's time for me to use some of my Jesus powers. Some little, I can do a little zappy zap here, right? And, and it wouldn't be like he wouldn't be giving nothing away. I mean, like, you could just make it look like lightning, right? You just kind of hang up there on the cross, you kind of go ding, ding, ding. And, um, and all of a sudden, lightning, boo, 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 boo. Like, where'd that storm come from, right? And it just take them take out. That's what I would do. That's where my heart's at. It would be just, wouldn't it? But what does he say? Father, forgive them. They they do not know what they're doing. He forgave his enemies. That's what he did. I mean, no cursing them. No punishing them. Not even simply just ignoring them. Actively, verbally forgiving them. As he has been tortured, he's being executed, and being mocked by everyone around him. He verbally and out loud says, God, don't hold this against them. They don't really understand what's happening. I'm going to be honest. I can't even really put my mind around that. I could act like we did, like I do, and we could just kind of have like a normal little churchy time here. It's like, well, and, and Jesus was very forgiving of those people who hurt him. And so you too need to go out there, and if someone's hurt you, you need to forgive them. Like, how do, what am I comparing it to? Like, my wife hurts my feelings, right? She says something ugly to me, and then I'm passive aggressive for a couple of days. I kind of try to hurt her back, and I'm holding the grudge for a couple of days. Hey, don't do that. Like, okay, right, Jesus. Uh, it's like it's it's so far. Like I mean, the, the grudges that I hold over small things. Like even if I could get over that, I feel like I'm still not anywhere close to the weight of this. Of Jesus looking at the people who are unjustly executing him. Now there have been some people in history who have endured things like this and have shown that kind of character. But for most of us, man, we're, this is nothing. This is completely off the charts for us. This level of character. And grace and compassion. I'll say it, I guess. And there is nothing that has happened to you that you get to take a stand and say, well, but I'm not going to forgive them for this. You just don't have anything comparable. And if you do, even if you can rise to the level of this thing that has happened to me is on par with that. Jesus still said and gave forgiveness. But here's the other thing that I think is going on here with Jesus. Because he could have just, he could have just said that in a silent prayer. But he says it out loud. I think in part so we would know that he said it. So that we would even deeper understand the nature of his forgiveness. And his compassion. And that so that we would then at least make an attempt or know that we're being called to forgive because Jesus says this forgive the way that you've been forgiven you know and and so we see that but I think he said it out loud also in that moment for them for those people in the belief and the hope that some of them at some point in their life would recognize who Jesus was and, and, and would have and would have life with him And we actually see that. There are actually a couple of the Roman guards after Jesus dies. There's this major earthquake and it just kind of just, wait a second. I think this was the Son of God. And can you imagine in that moment 
the Son of God is now dead because you killed him, and you come to that realization, where, I mean, where's your, how, do, how do you get over that? But what if you can remember? I, he already forgave me. How incredibly powerful that is. Because, I mean, we all recognize, I mean, murder really is kind of the worst thing that you can do. But if you think about, I mean, murdering God's son? I mean, if, I mean, some of us, man, we struggle with. We struggle with really believing that God can forgive me for the things that I've done. Well, he's forgiven this. And I would imagine that they would wrestle with that. But here Jesus is verbalizing for their benefit. I forgive you. And our benefit too. I assure you whatever the thing is that you're holding on to, whatever it is that you believe that somehow God is not forgiving, it's it's not this. And very clearly and boldly with incredible compassion, he says he forgives them. And so what I think that we see there, and we see it again in this other thing that says, it's not that he only forgave his enemies. I mean, he, was, he saved the lost. He was looking for lost people to try and save. And we see that with the criminals on the cross. We've got, we got one criminal over here mocking him, and we've got this other criminal over here. And he's like, hey, I, I, I know I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a criminal. But I see that you're very different than that. And I recognize that you're going to have a kingdom. He probably had no idea really what he was saying when you come into your kingdom. He, probably had, he, didn't, he didn't know. He didn't have some great deep understanding of the nature of who Jesus was or what kind of kingdom he was going to have. He just knew that next to him was the Son of God and, and was going to be a king of some kind. And he said, when you become king, will you please remember me? And he looks at him and says, man, let me say this. Today, me and you will be in paradise together. So at this moment of incredible weakness, of pain, of torture, he's reaching out to this criminal and offering him life. That's the kind of compassion and grace and love that Jesus has for people. That even in that moment, he's forgiven a criminal. And I'm telling you, I've been around a long time, read a lot of books, and heard a lot of sermons, and people always talk about this thief on the cross. Because whatever it is that you believe about Jesus, whatever it is you believe about what it means that Jesus saves us, whatever it is you mean by saying God offers forgiveness for free, whatever it is, whatever it is you believe about that, this has to be taken into account. Because if it applies to whatever I believe, it has to apply to this guy. And let's make sure that we understand everything that we can know about this guy that Jesus forgave. Up until this point in his life, he was just a criminal. He was a criminal. He was not a follower of Jesus in any way. I have no reason to believe that he was warm towards God. He was a criminal. He was being executed. He hadn't done anything right. And now he is at his last moment. And he's not going to be able to do one good thing for God afterwards. Right? Jesus forgives him and then they both die. And God gives him life. It wasn't about anything, anything. It was not about anything that that man had done at any point in his life before that moment. And it was not about anything that he was going to do after the fact. It was just a moment of pure forgiveness and compassion that Jesus offers to this guy. And I'm telling you, that probably should change the way that you view Jesus in forgiveness. It was very unlikely that there are many, if any, people here in this room that have really allowed that truth to sink in deeply with them. Because I think that most of us, even if we do right on the quiz, and I'm not talking about how you do on a theology quiz, Jesus' forgiveness, free or not. Free. You get a point, right? You know, is it based on any works you've done? No. Do you have to do good things afterwards to earn it in hindsight? No. 
Hey, we do great on the quiz, but you're not. Let's say you're not. We're not. We don't live the internship out very well, right? The short answer, yeah. The essay, not so much. The practicum, not at all, because we don't live like this. I don't know if this is how you are, but this is how I am. This is kind of what what sneaks into my brain. Yeah, it's free. Jesus died on the cross. I'm a sinner. I understand that. Jesus, I'm a sinner. And Jesus died on the cross for me. And it's to forgive me of my sins. He paid a debt, this debt of death that I owe. He paid it for me. And that was given to me freely. Right. I understand that. And I don't have to do anything afterwards to earn it in hindsight. I don't have to pay it on the front end. I don't have to pay it back. I don't have to pay for it. And it's also not like a layaway plan either. Right? Where you get it and then you pay it off later. It's not rent to own. It's not installments. It's free on both ends. But let's be honest, right, though? Can we just be honest? When Jesus was looking at people he wanted to give this thing to for free, he like, yeah but, yeah, but I like that guy. That guy's pretty solid. He's a relatively good guy. He's better than a lot of other people, and he's got skills, and I, I mean, he'll, he'll, he'll work hard and do some good things for me. So we've got to make sure I get this guy on my team. It's free, but... If he, if, if he were grading on a curve, right? Me. And I don't think I'm weird. Well, I do think I'm weird. But I don't think in this instance what I think is unusual. I think that we lose sight of the fact um, that we didn't earn it. And we lose sight of the fact of just how completely and totally free it is and how completely forgiving Jesus is. And so some of you, some of you are here and you were just, we're just be honest. You've never really made this yours. Jesus has offered it to you the way that he was offering forgiveness to everyone there who was throwing insults at him. It was offered, but you've never taken it. You've never made it yours. You've never claimed it to be yours. You're coming to church, and that's good, and you're fond of Jesus, and that's good. But you've never really said, you've never really embraced the forgiveness, either because you've, you're still stuck in that I don't deserve it. You're still stuck in that. Or are you still stuck in this idea that I've got, to get, I've got to get better first? You don't know this thing that I did. You don't know this thing that I'm doing. I've got to resolve that first. And that's just not what, that's not what this story is about. You need to make it yours. It is being offered to you freely. And you can take it freely. And so that is, you, I encourage you. I encourage you to take it today. I encourage you to tell us that you have, so we can, we can celebrate with you, that, so that you can be um, baptized, and we can just celebrate the new life that God has given you. Please don't let another day pass. And just kind of stay on the fringes of fond of God and Jesus, and not truly embracing and living, accepting the forgiveness and life that is offered through Jesus Christ. Now for... for for the rest of us, it's not that we need to do it once. It's just we've lost touch. We've lost touch. We've, we've kind of gotten that place in our brain where we think either I earned it a little bit on the front end because I was a relatively good person or really I'm kind of paying it back now by being such a good person. And we lose sight of the fact of just how completely gracious and forgiving God was of us. And I can sit here in a place like that. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. I didn't have to do anything to get it, and I don't have to do anything to keep it. It is a free gift, fully given to me by God. And, and that should draw us deeper to Jesus, and it should be freedom. Now I don't have to do anything. I just get to live a life of gratitude. To a God who has given me everything. And let's just be honest. If I told you you had to do certain things in order to keep God's favor. 
it would, it would look very, it would, you know, you know I'm going to come to church, I'm going to go to Bible studies, and I'm going to give money, I'm going to try to serve, try to be a good person. I'm going to do all these things. And it doesn't really look a whole lot of different. Like, hey, man, you should just live a life of gratitude, of appreciation towards God. What should I do? Well, you should come to church, give Bible studies. You should give. You should be a good person. On the one hand, it can kind of look the same. But the freedom that comes and the long-term ability to just be able to rest and celebrate what an awesome God and what a loving, forgiving God He is I tell you, that's very different. And my encouragement to everyone in here is to live under the real freedom that comes from understanding how fully gracious and forgiving the God of the universe has been to you through Jesus. So let's just respond to that. Let's just pray that God will somehow draw each one of us just a, a little bit closer with a deeper level of understanding of what Jesus Christ really did for us. So as we worship, celebrate it. We have multiple opportunities to respond in the back. Through communion, just a reflection of uh, of what it is. It's a commemoration of this death. His body broken for you in the bread. His blood spilt for you in in, in the drink. And and you take it and you you dip it and and you eat it and... And you remember and reflect. There's prayer candles back there. You can pray there at a cross. The prayer team would love to pray with you. We have an opportunity to give. We have so many different ways to respond. But let's do that. Let's respond. Let's allow our hearts to draw closer to this Jesus who has given us so much. Let's pray. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for that thief on the cross. I thank you for those soldiers. God, I thank you for just the the power of forgiveness that is seen in that story. And God, I pray that we would live lives that reflect that. And whether it be for the first time or for the next time, God, that we would fully trust in that. Not trusting in our own ability to get things done, to be a good person, to follow all the rules. But we would fully embrace the forgiveness the way it was offered, completely and totally freely. And then, God, I pray that we would live like forgiven people full of gratitude to you and offering the same forgiveness everywhere that we can. We love you, God. And we thank you for his son, his death for us, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.